Good morning and welcome to day two at the International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare. My name's Helen Bevan and I'm part of the Strategic Advisory Board for the International Forum. This year has been the first year that we have had a well-being programme and we are thrilled at how many people have taken part in the well-being and yoga sessions at the Forum. In fact, it's been so popular that we thought we should ask Carol Stewart, our yoga teacher, to help us as an improvement community to build some positive energy to sustain us through the day. So yoga means unity, unity of mind, body and spirit. It's about a connection to a, a deeper meaning, a deeper purpose. And what could have a deeper meaning than the patient-centred mission that unites us all at the forum this week? So, if you can stand, I would like to ask you to. And I'm going to introduce Carol, who is going to take us through some sequences to awaken our minds and bodies for the day. Carol. Good morning, everyone. It's beautiful to be here. Now that you're up standing, I'd like you just to check your alignment. So just making sure that your feet are comfortably apart and your weight is distributed evenly between right and left side. I don't want you to look, to look like tin soldiers. Just relax your knees, take them off lock. Tuck your tummy in and your bottom under. Just roll your shoulders up, back, and let them drop naturally. With your fingers just gently curled. Taking your chin to your chest, and just coming up and looking forward. Just going within and checking your spine and feeling how lovely it is to be standing correctly. You should be sitting like that as well at the desk. We'll start with our breathing, so you've all been rushing to get here. So just a nice little sighing breath out. Breathe in through your nostrils and let it all go with a ah. <sighs> Feel it. Again, breathing in and sighing out. <sighs> Closing your eyes now, going within your body, and we're just going to tune in to our breathing. I don't want you to um, take in a big gulp of air. I just want you to breathe normally and be aware of the four steps in one breath. So just saying to yourself, as, as I say it, I am breathing in, I am holding, I am exhaling, I am pausing. I am breathing in, I am holding, I am exhaling, I am pausing. Open eyes, straight away, feeling nice and calm. Uh, we'll just open our legs a little, a little wider. And it's lovely to start the day with a cuddle. If you haven't received a cuddle from anyone, give it to yourselves. So wrap your right arm around in front. Bend your knees, keep those feet grounded. Chin to chest, breathing in, just leaning forward as far as you can. And then on exhalation, slowly coming up and looking at the ceiling. Breathing in back to centre. As you exhale, a nice little twist to the right. Unlocking that spine. Breathing in, slowly coming back to centre. And exhale to the left. We must balance our body, so that's only one side. So cross the arms over. Relax the shoulders, breathe in. As you exhale, bend the knees, 
slowly taking your chin to your chest and going forward as far as you can. Breathing in, slowly coming up and exhale, tilting back. Breathing in centre, exhale, a nice little twist to the right. Feel that lovely spinal twist. Breathing in centre, exhale to the left. And then back to centre. Beautiful. So easy. Come on, up we go. Come on, Carol, energize. I can hear you. I can hear you, but I can't hear the audience. You can't hear them? No. Okay, we'll show them. Tuck those elbows into the side, make a fist, and we're really going to get there. So breathe in and a... <laughs> Really push back. Get deep down into these lungs. Breathe in. Come on, one more. Beautiful. Legs in under your hips. Hands down by your side. Fingers gently curled. Just being aware of that breathing again. I am breathing in. I am breathing out. I am ready to receive the wisdom that I may seek. Have a lovely day. Keep smiling. Namaste. Thank you, Carol. Welcome everyone. You look very beautiful and relaxed from here. Welcome also to our colleagues joining from our remote participation program in Osaka, Japan, Singapore, New Zealand in Canterbury and Wellington, and Australia in Melbourne and Townsville. I hope that wherever you are in the world, you have had a lovely, refreshing start to the day. Thank you again to our sponsors, our platinum sponsor, KPMG, and our other sponsors, the Health Foundation and Bupa, to whom we are enormously grateful. Uh, I've just got a few announcements. There's a breakfast sessions tomorrow. Uh, There's two breakfast sessions. One is um, introducing the new BMJ Quality Improvement Program, uh, and you can find out more about that on our website, bmj.com slash quality. So please do go and have a look. And if you're able to come to that breakfast session, uh, Ashley McKim and colleagues will be telling you about the BMJ's exciting new initiative on quality improvement. And the second breakfast session tomorrow is a walking breakfast through IHI's global initiatives. Again, I hope as many of you as possible will go to that um, and you need to book at the registration desk. Do visit our exhibitors. And if you're a poster presenter, again, Um, do be near your poster and um, try and attract people in to have a chat about what you've been doing. We're we're so delighted to have so many really excellent posters here this year and and really congratulations to those of you who've who've managed to get posters at the conference. Today we have those two special student and junior doctor events that I mentioned yesterday. The The Great British Pub Quiz is at lunch And this evening, the Million Pound Challenge, which is the Dragon's Den event, um, where people tell us, four students are telling us what they would do with a million pounds to improve healthcare. So register for those if you haven't already done so. Now, um, yesterday I asked who hadn't yet got a Twitter account, and I said I'd ask the same question today. Let me first of all tell you that the um, Quality Forum has got 400 new followers since yesterday, so that's great. Um, but I wondered if I could just ask anyone who has now, who didn't have a Twitter account yesterday morning and has one now to raise their hand. Oh, bravo, bravo. Congratulations. Um, those of you who haven't yet done that, <laughs> there will be a Twitter clinic immediately after this morning's keynote. Um, at meeting point A. So any Luddites or people who are confused or worried about Twitter, there's your place to get help. Um, And also the event guide, as I said yesterday, has some information in it. 
please do tweet through the sessions. Um, we're collecting the, the uh, comments, and um, if you tweet during this next keynote, for example, those questions will be um, put to the speaker and we'll get um, the responses. So, hashtag quality 2013, tweet away. Um, there's a special lunchtime session today at 12.45, how the US healthcare system mobilized care and coped during Hurricane Sandy, and the wonderful Ross Wilson is going to be um, running that, so please do attend that if you can at lunchtime. And I think that's the end of the announcements I've got to make. So I have the wonderful pleasure of handing you over to my other, the other Fiona in this uh, event, Dr. Fiona Moss. Thanks very much. Uh, it gives me great uh, personal and, pro um, and uh, professional pleasure to introduce Dame Ruth Carnell as the next keynote. When I was Director of Medical and Dental Education Commissioning for London, Ruth was the Chief Executive of NHS London. One of the explicit aims of NHS London was excellence in education. Working with a strategic health authority that understood and clearly articulated the central and strategic importance of education to good quality care and for quality and safety improvement was liberating. The support of NHS London stimulated significant educational innovation across the capital, enabled us, an educational um, organisation within NHS London, to live our educational objective of improving the quality and safety of care for today's and tomorrow's doctors. Some of London's doctors in training are here at the conference and just some of the work they've done as a result of NHS London's support and investment is on view in the poster section. But I'm also a Londoner and I know, as you will hear, that I and my family benefit from the changes that Ruth has brought about through her strategic leadership. Ruth has had a distinguished um, career, mostly in the public sector and for 25 years in the NHS. She has held senior leadership positions at local, regional and national level. Her career began in finance, holding various posts in a number of NHS organisations before taking the position of finance director at Hastings Health Authority in 1987. In 1992, Ruth became chief executive at Hastings and Rother NHS Trust. She was then chief executive of West Kent um, um, Health Authority for six years before she moved to the civil service to take the position of regional director. Southeast, and then Director of Health and Social Care for the South. From April 2003 until September 2004, she served as Director of the, De of the De Departmental Change Programme at the Department of Health. Between 2004 and 2007, she worked as a freelance consultant in NHS London and also in government departments, including the Prime Minister's Delivery um, Unit and the Home Office. Ruth was a non-executive director of the Cabinet Office until 2010, and until April 2007 was a non-executive director at, at Care UK PLC. She's going to talk today about the work she did in her role as the Chief Executive of NHS London, Stroke Care London, Large Scale Change. I'll give you Ruth Carnell. Thank you. Um, I feel even relaxed myself after that uh, yoga, so if you can get the keynote speaker to feel relaxed, I think it's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak about the work that we've been doing in London. I hope it has relevance uh, to people not just from this country, but from elsewhere. Um, to start with, uh, stroke is the second biggest killer. Uh, it's the most common cause of disability uh, in London. And amongst our population of almost 8 million people, 11,500 strokes occur per annum. So for us, it's a massive issue, as I'm sure it is um, in other parts of the world. In 2006, when I started as chief executive um, in NHS London, our performance on stroke care was absolutely woeful, uh, certainly in international uh, context and even in a UK context. So just over 50% of stroke victims were looked after in a proper stroke ward less than 1% of patients would receive 
um, thrombolysis, clot busting drugs. Very few would get access to 24-7 specialist care. And across a whole range of indicators measured uh, nationally, only three out of 30 admitting hospitals were anywhere near meeting the standards. And I should say that at that time, the standards themselves were hardly exacting. Uh, and to make matters worse, uh, despite the existence of a national strategy on stroke, um, our performance overall, certainly in acute uh, care, was getting worse. Um, so as an example, uh, the standard at the time was that you needed to have an urgent brain scan in 24 hours. That's not exactly an exacting standard, and we were failing to meet that. So you can see here the performance of the 30 hospitals in London at the left-hand side, a very small number meeting what were very weak targets. And the difference between 2004 and 2006, in many cases, getting worse, and certainly in those that were getting better, not meeting the standards that were set. Today, almost all patients, almost 100% of patients with a suspected stroke who dial 999, will go to one of eight hyperacute stroke centres where they can expect to receive every possible form of specialist care immediately that they arrive. Uh, that's rather than going to their local hospital. These centres are positioned around London so that the average journey time is 14 minutes uh, from the call and less than 30 minutes in total as a standard. Um, almost 20% of stroke victims now receive um, thrombolysis, uh, which is uh, certainly better than anywhere else in this country and better than any single city in the rest of the world. So if any of you are unfortunate enough uh, to suffer a stroke while you're here, you're in the right city in the world uh, to have that. Um, our mortality rates are now 28% lower uh, than the average for the rest of England, and we have between two and 300 fewer deaths each year. And importantly, the patient satisfaction with the service is extremely high. So I'm pleased today to be able to tell you about that journey, that transformation journey, but also perhaps to share with you some of the lessons that we've learned along the way and to be clear about the things that still need to be done. It's not a finished story by any means. A little bit of background necessary to understand uh, the context. Uh, healthcare in London is a story of diversity, uh, not always uh, good diversity. There's very significant health inequalities in this city, uh, big di uh, divergence in life expectancy. Uh, in many parts of London, poor access to what turns out then to be very poor primary care. The standard of primary care is very variable across the city. Some of the most needy people get some of the poorest access to what then turns out to be some of the poorest uh, primary care. And as a result of that, our population have an excessive reliance on hospital services. And at the other end of the spectrum, despite having some of the country's most prestigious teaching hospitals, there's a wholly inadequate centralization of specialist services. Now, some progress has been made on that, of which the stroke story is one, uh, but those problems, those inherent problems still remain. And as a consequence, uh, for many services, we deliver a relatively poor value for money and poor value for taxpayers. So the stroke story is a part of our attempt to do something about that. Um, healthcare in this country is always amongst the top three of the population's concerns, and as a result of that, it's a hugely political issue. And within the country, uh, the politics of healthcare in London are far more uh, exposed than anywhere else. London has a higher political profile for obvious reasons. So if you couple that with the power, prestige, and independence of the city's major teaching hospitals, you can see that the capital is uniquely resistant to attempts to make whole system change. London's littered with failed attempts at reform. Uh, so the first properly recorded review of healthcare services in the capital was, believe it or not, in 1892, uh, when the House of Lords received a select committee report, which it says they received warmly. So I interpret the word warmly to mean that they didn't do anything about it after they'd received it. And it said there are too many hospitals in the centre of London, not enough in the periphery. There's inadequate uh, primary care. Uh, the hospitals have overlapping services and duplication, and they lack coherence, and they compete with each other on inappropriate, in inappropriate ways. Now, since that review, there have been 11 further reviews 
and all of them have said broadly the same thing with greater and greater degrees of sophistication. So you can imagine that when I took up my role in 2006, it was with some uh, trepidation that I approached the task of developing a strategic plan for healthcare in London, uh, given all those failed attempts in the past by people with a degree of eminence uh, in the field. Uh, we were hugely lucky to commission uh, Professor Lord Darcy of Denham to undertake a comprehensive review of healthcare services in London. He was and remains an eminent surgeon, respected in this country and abroad. He came from our system and yet he had a degree of independence because of his international work and his international reputation. In 2007, he published his findings, uh, which were based on extensive research and working with literally hundreds of clinical colleagues, not just from this country, but from elsewhere. He published his report, Healthcare for London, a framework for action. He left us with the rather more difficult task of uh, implementing it. In fact, almost the day after he published his report, he was appointed as a minister for the then Labour government, so disappeared completely uh, from our sphere. So how to make this review different than the 11 that had preceded it? Well, previous reviews have been led by outsiders and then they'd, as it were, arrived uh, in London uh, and somehow people were expected to magically implement a set of complex and controversial recommendations. So no ownership, uh, no leadership of the change program, no sustained commitment to taking forward uh, the changes. So we were determined, absolutely determined, that this time things would be different. Um, and we kept hold of our hundreds of clinical leaders in London. It has been the greatest privilege of my role uh, to work with some fantastic doctors, nurses, and others prepared to put their energy uh, and their commitment into taking change forward across this city. Uh, we had intensive and sustained engagement, not just with the general population, but with our key partners uh, across the service, uh, with different professions, uh, with leadership and with frontline staff. And crucially, we undertook a formal and ultimately legally binding consultation process on the changes we wanted to see. Now that, on the one hand, gave us the advantage of a secure platform, but it also posed obligations. Uh, if you legally consult on something, you can't then turn around later and say, well, actually, we didn't really mean it. We don't really want to do it. Uh, and lastly, we undertook a process of very rigid prioritization, and that had never been done with previous reviews. And that last point brings me to our stroke program. Across the whole of London, we selected only five priorities. So you can imagine that the downside of that was huge anger and frustration on the part of those who thought we were ignoring very important services, and indeed we were. Um, but my uh, view at the time was we need to say what we're going to do and then do it uh, in a limited way, but to have an impact, to give us confidence, to give a platform, uh, you know, to give some credibility in a sense to the processes that we'd undertaken. So as the chief executive of the NHS in London, I made it my business to continually reinforce those five priorities in everything that I did, whether it was appraisals of my staff, whether it was rewarding grants for education and training or whatever, we reinforced those priorities, of which stroke care was one. So with stroke, there's a very, very clear case for change, and it is uh, compelling. We had poor, uncoordinated care, as you've seen, deteriorating standards, and it's a major killer. Uh, and as usual in London, uh, we had poor access uh, to care which was concentrated in the centre of the city. So here you can see the darker colours, uh, the shaded colours represent the incidence of stroke. More strokes, broadly speaking, in the periphery of London, fewer in the centre. And yet the services provided like this. Concentration and overlap of service in the centre of London and gaps and weaker services in the periphery. So our preliminary strategy, which was produced by clinicians working with us, was not uh, site-specific, but it was clear about the model of care that we expected to be available for every single member of our population, and also for those outside London who use London for their acute services. So our model of care was direct admission for everybody with a suspected stroke to one of eight 
hyperacute stroke centres where people could expect to uh, receive every form of specialist care appropriate to stroke 24 hours a day, a maximum journey time of 30 minutes, uh, acute stroke units distributed around London to ensure that after 72 hours in a hyperacute centre, patients could be repatriated to a hospital close to their home for intensive rehabilitation, uh, dedicated open access TIA clinics uh, for all the population positions so that every general practitioner had close local access and investment in early supported discharge. We had a really strong, well-resourced program management approach chaired by a chief executive. We had an expert clinical panel with international representation on it. One of the features of London tends to be that people think they know best inside London. Um, and it was really important for me to bring international expertise to bear on this problem. We brought particularly colleagues from Canada who showed us what it had been possible to do there. We had a scrutiny panel made up of every one of the 33 London boroughs, recognising that ultimately this would mean the downgrading of some significant local services. Uh, we had expert modelling capacity, both from King's College London and from the London School of Economics, to give us a clear model for how patients would be transported uh, both straight to uh, major centres and from there to their local hospital and hence home and an extensive engagement programme with patients, the public, the third sector, professions and everybody that you would expect to be involved. There were plenty of prophets of doom, as my colleague calls them at the time, even within the NHS. So uh, variously people would say it's not possible to implement major system change in something as complex as stroke. Uh, the staffing levels are not achievable. Uh, patients won't accept being taken from their local hospital to a centre along railway. You can't guarantee a 30-minute travel time for everybody. Look how busy London is. Look at their transport infrastructure, the uh, jams that you get in the roads. Repatriation is going to fail. Every uh, hyperacute stroke centre will be full within the first few days. Uh, NHS Trust will fight and hang on to their own services. It'll be unsustainable. Uh, but this was a moment for me to stick to our guns and see whether or not actually we could see this thing through. So all hospitals were invited to tender uh, for this, which is an unusual approach to take across the whole of London. We want to make it open to everybody. We didn't want anybody saying they had been denied the opportunity of participating in this new model. And we set a series of very challenging and very detailed standards that significantly exceeded the national standards that were set at the time. These were evaluated against three key determinants, quality, um, geography and access, and also coherence. So one of the features of our system in the past has been uh, to deal with the controversy about who gets what service. Often things have been uh, handed out, as it were, in an even fashion. And we wanted to use this to reinforce uh, important points about coherence. So, for example, we wanted to make sure that in designating major trauma centres, which we did later on, we could be certain that every major trauma centre also had a hyperacute stroke centre co-located with it in order to maximise the best use of scarce neuroscience um, resources and maximise the opportunities to invest in research, education and training and specialised service provision. Uh, this process generated some difficult results for us, as you might uh, imagine. So the highest quality bids all came from the centre of London, from those hospitals that I showed you on the slide which were overlapping. Uh, the poorer bids came from the periphery. So it was necessary to uh, turn down some high quality bids in favour of some poor quality ones on grounds of making sure that the access that we wanted was available for all 8 million of our population. So this meant that some clinicians had to oversee the downgrading of a good unit in favour of investing their time in supporting and building up what were at the time very poor ones. We were also rigid about the number of hyperacute stroke centres that we were going to have. Uh, it would have been very easy to say, OK, well, we'll have nine or we'll have ten in order to deal with the level of opposition that there was, but we stuck to the validity of the modelling that we'd done. Similarly, the stroke units uh, were not designated unless they could show that they were meeting every single one 
of the 60 standards that we set and they had to meet those before they got the financial support uh, to deliver. So it was at their risk uh, rather than at the program's risk. Between February and May 2009, we undertook a very detailed and formal consultation process in every one of London's 33 boroughs, and this process was led uh, by our clinicians. It's one of the uh, features of our system that to get agreement to any change of any significance um, is subject to a highly complex set of consultation procedures. Largely, I have to say, driven by uh, a political desire for consensus. Uh, and so this is a painful process, trying to uh, consult on a program that's about the whole of London separately in each of 33 boroughs uh, was a painful business. But in the end, uh, we gained agreement to this model of care and to the designation of the eight uh, centres and the supporting stroke units. So the pink dots represent where the hyperacute stroke centres were located, and as you can see, there are three um, in the outer part of London, where in the past there certainly would not have been any specialist centre of the type that we now have uh, there. And in addition to that, uh, we had stroke units and transient ischemic attack centres which are available for open access distributed, as you can see. So um, a logical and planned distribution of services on the basis of a combination of quality, access and coherence with other services. We appointed a clinical director for stroke, Professor Tony Rudd, um, a doctor from St. Thomas's Hospital. In fact, a hospital who provided a very good service but whose service needed to be downgraded in order to deliver uh, the model that we've uh, set out and hugely, um, frankly, heroic uh, leadership on his part to oversee the development across the whole of London and manage the consequences for his own unit. Uh, we invested in an extensive recruitment and training program for all specialist staff and very significant investment in the London Ambulance Service such that anybody ringing 999 could guarantee to be triaged properly to an appropriate centre. And every commissioner in London, all 32 of the PCTs, were required to invest in this process. So what are the outcomes uh, from the work that we've done? Well, we have some uh, UK comparative data from one year on, just one year into this uh, model. Uh, and it shows on the left-hand side uh, at that time as the, a comparison between the achievement of London centres and those elsewhere. So a composite of the seven standards as they then were nationally, 75% for London, and uh, the number of patients directly admitted on the right hand side. Now that was uh, a year into this process. If you looked at this data now, we don't have the national data to compare, but certainly on the right hand side, uh, the London admission numbers will be approaching 100%. Um, so we've made substantial progress since then, but the important thing for me about this slide was it's possible to show that once implemented, change can be made very quickly. Even if it takes a long time to get to the starting point, uh, you can then make quick progress afterwards. So the London Stroke Model is now fully implemented across the capital and seven out of the eight top stroke units in the country are in London. As I say, almost all uh, suspected strokes go to a hyperacute stroke centre. Our thrombolysis rates are now at 20% of the, all strokes, and as you know, any some are appropriate for that, and that compares to a national average of 10%. 40% of our patients go home directly from the hyperacute stroke centre. We have the lowest length of stay in the country. Our mortality is substantially less, patient satisfaction high. However, lots of people, as you might imagine, argued that the reason why these improvements had been made was simply because of the amount of money that we'd thrown at it. And that had we thrown that amount of money at other services, they would have improved in the same way. So uh, we commissioned uh, uh, an independent study from University College London, which has now been published, which shows that at the 30-day point after a stroke, it is indeed more expensive, 3.3 million pounds more, but with 218 less deaths. And if you take that analysis to a 10-year point, so 10 years after uh, a stroke cohort has had the, their um, treatment, the costs are in fact over £20 million less. 
So this study has demonstrated that this, as a result of reduced disability, of course, has actually saved money or will save money. So it's a fantastic indicator that you can improve quality and improve access and still save uh, money. Uh, the findings that we have are uh, within li in line with the original modelling, other than uh, we didn't expect to be able to discharge so many people straight from the hyperacute stroke centre home. We expected far more to have to be repatriated to a local unit. So that's been a positive benefit for us that we've been able to send many more people home. But importantly, I think it's debunked uh, the myth that whilst the quality of care was excellent, it was too expensive. I think the quality of care is excellent and it's not too expensive. So what reflections would I have then? What lessons um, looking, looking back over this program? Well, the positives are very clear. So the huge improvements in stroke care, uh, widely recognized and certainly experienced by patients, commented on by general practitioners, by uh, nurses, therapists, and everybody. But for me, it also gave us a platform uh, to make other system-wide change in London. So we've since built on that and dealt with vascular surgery in the same way. We've dealt with trauma in the same way. We've dealt with cardiac, uh, acute cardiac care in the same way. And progress is now being made on cancer care and crucially on acute surgery as well. All of which uh, were services which desperately needed centralization if they were going to deliver anything like world-class outcomes. I think it's given people confidence that you can deliver change across a whole system as complex as a capital like ours. Uh, it gave fantastic uh, collaboration between uh, commissioners, providers, managers, uh, clinicians, and even uh, on occasions politicians and uh, public sector workers, which is unusual, uh, certainly in this city, if not in this country as a whole. But the most compelling thing for me was the way in which many uh, people, clinicians especially, were able to rise above the demands of their own institutions and put the needs of London's whole population first, rather than sitting in their own silo and trying to defend that. The negatives, on the other hand, so first and foremost in my mind, the politics of delivering change in the NHS are close to unmanageable. So uh, in May 2010, uh, the new Secretary of State uh, arrived and halted Healthcare for London, the entire programme, uh, and that included uh, the stroke programme. So at that point, the whole thing was stopped uh, and delayed. Now, for me, uh, it was a measure of the clinical support that we had for change that people, despite that level of political opposition, were willing and brave enough to stand up and say, no, the evidence for this change is strong and we're still going to do it. Um, but to have the Secretary of State say, no, this program can't go ahead is a formidable, is a formidable barrier. And that started what has been the, the ninth uh, of uh, reorganization that I've experienced in my, in my career. And as a result of that, a big disruption, really, to the, uh, to the program, to the clinical networks and all the rest of it that we put in place. So a real uh, credit to the clinicians in this city that they continued bravely to take this program forward. And of course, now the results are clear. People are happy to say that it was a good thing to do. Uh, there was bitter opposition at local level uh, to what people thought was a loss of local service. And I think people also thought that there was some sort of plot at the back of this to undermine their local hospital in a way which would then result in it falling over in other ways. And certainly that was uh, the furthest thing from our mind. And I think people do now accept that this has, in fact, enhanced the role of uh, particularly local stroke units in a way that they wouldn't have been able to do uh, with the resources that they had at their disposal uh, locally. And perhaps most significantly of all, uh, this program took two years uh, in consultation, in tackling the politics, in dealing with processes, really, that were not anything to do with the investment that needed to be made in improvement. So we spent two years on bureaucracy, and during that two years, more than 400 people died who didn't need to. So that's the thing that sticks in my mind, uh, that we took two years over the process. And certainly, uh, if you look at the scale of change that's needed in healthcare in this country, 
it cannot be done in that sort of way where it takes over two years to make a change that is very well evidenced and very clear and has a lot of support. Many of the changes that we want to make, unfortunately, do not have that clarity of evidence at the back of them. So it needed all of the clinical leadership that we could muster and some admittedly top-down management from ourselves and a need to stick very rigidly to some of the things that we wanted to achieve. Um, now, of course, people say uh, that it was easy. So I get lots of people saying, no, yeah, but the, uh, the stroke program was easy, whereas this uh, is difficult. That's um, what I like to think of as a sort of rose-tinted retrospectoscope. You know, you look back on this and it was an easy process. Um, just as, a, uh, as, a, as an aside, um, I can remember one particularly hostile meeting with a group of members of parliament uh, in which one of them... Uh, said that I was rather like Cruella de Vil, um, for which, um, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a cartoon character of a woman who skins puppies alive and then makes fur coats out of them. So, you know, it was seen as um, such a bad thing to do that that's what he chose to uh, refer to as that. So to now say that it was all very straightforward, I think, uh, you know, undermines the amount of opposition that there was and will be to any other change that people try to attempt now. Um, so what next? Uh, what might come next? The NHS has just gone through the biggest and most complex set of reforms in its history. And that, of course, could be the topic of a whole uh, different address. Uh, London's, just as I give you one uh, important fact uh, from that, so London's commissioning landscape up until the end of March had seven organisations within it broadly, with one um, in charge. The new landscape has 74 organisations within it, with none in overall charge. So uh, politicians would have us believe that these changes represent a reduction in bureaucracy, and I simply don't think that's the case. 74 organisations will have to figure out how to work together. Now, having said that, there are some fantastic examples of change being taken forward at local level by clinical commissioning groups in London. There are some fantastic new local leaders who will uh, take forward change with a really innovative approach. But there are a number of things that still need to be done across whole populations, and they will need to figure out how to work together. So the risks of the system that we've just finished putting in place is clearly fragmentation. Uh, there are more services that need a similar whole system approach, and even in stroke care, uh, there's quite a lot more that needs to be done. We need to make sure these standards don't slip. Uh, we can still do better on acute care. Uh, we need to think more carefully about how to make sure that the population identify the onset of stroke more quickly and get to the phone more quickly. Uh, we need to make sure that there aren't any short-sighted cuts in the uh, staff and support that we've put in place because the service overall is saving money, so it would be uh, very short-sighted to cut it now. And we need to invest substantially in what remains very variable, long-term, uh, more slow-stream rehabilitation. So there's still a lot to do on stroke, regardless of all the other things that still need um, our attention. So London will need to find new ways of uh, coming together uh, to lead controversial change. Uh, but what's clear from this programme of work in stroke and more widely on healthcare for London is that there are literally hundreds of ambitious uh, clinicians in primary care, in secondary care, in tertiary care who are prepared, given the right support, to come forward and deliver huge transformation and put the needs of their organisation second to the needs of London's population as a whole. And for sure, there's still a whole lifetime's worth of work out there for them to do. Thank you very much for listening. Ruth, thank you very much indeed. I remember Ruth saying to me once that she didn't want to be known as a one-trick pony, having only done stroke care. But I think this is an absolutely extraordinary story um, that you have um, told, and the work that has been done in London is, is enormous. And actually, I know as a Londoner that, God forbid, I should have a stroke, that my chance of survival and, and actually um, survive with, without um, deficit is, is so much higher. And I'm absolutely aware of the opposition that has come to it. On, on, during this process, on a Saturday, I was met by a professor who I had worked for, and he said, are you coming on the march? Coming on the march? 
oh, what march? What march? And he said, just stop the Whittington Hospital's um, A&E being downgraded, which is my local hospital. It's been downgraded, but I know that my chance of recovering from stroke is much higher. So I, it, it's quite an interesting sort of um, perspective that some of our clinical colleagues have. We've actually, thank you very much, those of you who've been tweeting questions, it's brilliant. And I've just got a few minutes left, and I wonder, Ruth, we might take some, mm -hmm. s some of these tweeted mm -hmm. questions. Please keep on tweeting your questions, because Ruth, I'm very happy afterwards to answer the tweeted um, questions. We're going to perhaps do, do, a, do a film of that. Um, I mean, the first one I would like to ask you is about how do we work with our clinical colleagues who passionately believe in their local units, and actually will go to their local politicians and councillors to get them on board, the local councillors say, I've talked to the local professor, and you then get this extraordinary sort of head of political and clinical steam. How do we work with these passionate, caring people and help them to see that possibly fewer units is better? Um, there's two levels to answer that question at. So, so the first thing to say is this, the work that we did on stroke and, and on trauma as well actually provided a platform, I, th I think I said, for, for other changes, and it did that in a number of ways. One of the things that it uh, enabled us to, to work on, and actually there's, um, uh, there's a poster display here on the work that's uh, grown from this, is to think about how to set standards uh, for what you want to achieve. And m most clinicians will engage in a, in, a, in a piece of work that's about what, should this, what are the standards that we aspire to for this service? What should we be aspiring to for our patients? And uh, so our experience has been is you can get people to work on setting those standards and then say, okay, so those are the standards that we're going to adopt, those standards and these access arrangements. Then it's actually quite difficult then to say, well, I agree with those standards and I agree with what you've said about access, but not for my own local service. Uh, you know, that needs to be protected and maintained for other reasons. Actually, it's quite difficult uh, to argue it if you have a set of standards that have been appropriately validated. So that's, that's one thing. But at a more human level, one of the things that we found with the stroke program is we, uh, one of our work streams was about uh, workforce uh, and about the development of the workforce and training of uh, the workforce. And that enabled us to bring everybody who was involved in delivering stroke services uh, together in London and find ways of connecting them through networks to this new service model. So that gave people training opportunities, it gave people access to working on rotors that they otherwise wouldn't have had, it gave people in some local centres uh, the opportunity to expand uh, their service and expand their careers as a result, including um, nursing staff, not just doctors. So I think trying to make sure that if you plan a change like this, you think about who are the people who are going to be, who are going to lose, and make it, where it's possible, an opportunity for them to be engaged. So those two things together have enabled us to tackle some of that opposition. Um, but I don't think you'll ever take it away. I don't think, certainly in this country, as soon as you say, I'm going to change the colour of the paint on the door of this local hospital, you get a campaign that says they don't like that. That, that's how it is. People feel so powerfully about their NHS and about their local service. And that's a, for me, that's a positive thing. I mean, the fact that, you know, if you try to make a change, you stand in a town hall, wherever it is, and you get almost pelted with um, rotten eggs, you know, it's, uh, it's unpleasant, but it demonstrates the level of commitment amongst the population to, uh, to the service. So I don't think you'll ever really take that away. And in the case of the stroke program. It's only been, as I've said afterwards, that people have recognised it. And that's been true of the other changes we've made as well. People have only really recognised the value of them afterwards. So that's why I say to an extent it's about having brave and ambitious people who are prepared to put their head above the parapet. But those two things, number one, standards, engage people in that. And second, try to think about how you offer um, advantages to the whole workforce, not just to the ones that are, as it were, the winners. Yeah. Thank you very much. One of the sort of sets of questions here is about money, about finance. You started your career as, um, in finance, and they both talk about austerity. You know, Lund's approach to stroke care sounds like investing to save. How do you invest in times of austerity? Um, it's very uh, challenging, very, uh, very challenging uh, times, uh, but uh, one of the things that's clear, certainly if you look at London's um, health services are there's widely varying uh, standards of productivity for example so it isn't the case that every single pound that we're spending is being used as productively as it could be and there are plenty of opportunities for doing uh, 
better with the better with the same. And in the case of the stroke program, although we did have we did uh, demand that each primary care trust invested more money into this service at the beginning, uh, that money was not given to providers until they had demonstrated that they'd met the standards. So they had to invest at risk. And the way they did that was by improving their own uh, productivity and investing in it because they realized that down the track they would get the investment. So uh, I wouldn't be as pessimistic perhaps as the questioner implies that these things are possible. It, it does though require uh, somebody to be willing to take the risk. And unfortunately, often we find people are very under pressure, become very, very conservative about what they're willing to do. So one of the things um, I think is important for leaders is to be willing to support people to take risks and to innovate and to accept that sometimes the consequences of that are that things can go wrong. I think if you know the chief executives in the room and chief executives in our healthcare systems aren't prepared to take some risks on things that are genuinely uh, investor save, I think uh, you know we won't get anywhere. It's not for the clinicians to make those decisions. It seems to me. And if you look at the scale of what we're spending every day. Um, in a place like London, I simply don't accept that there isn't some financial flexibility to take forward change programmes of this size, where the evidence is clear and supportive. There's a talk that I've heard Maureen do several times, which is why the Director of Finance needs to know about quality. Um, and Maureen and I have uh, had discussions over that over the years. I, did you involve, actually, the Director of Finance in this? Because it seems to me once the Director of Finance understand the quality bit of things, then, in fact, that, that they're happy to, 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 to move priorities in order to... Did you involve the Directors of Finance at all? Um, we had a finance work stream, which was chaired by the Director of Finance from the Health Authority, and he led both an overall programme of work, actually, about Healthcare for London in the round, which demonstrated both from a provider perspective, why the models of care proposed were cost if, would be cost effective in the future, and why from a commissioner perspective uh, it was affordable uh, to go down the healthcare for London route. So he did a big uh, strategic uh, piece of work looking at the, uh, uh, the financial model for the, for the whole programme. And we had a finance director's working group on stroke, and one of the things that they did was to work out a stroke tariff. So the way that these um, that the funds flowed to individual providers on the stroke care program wasn't sort of, you know, we're going to pay for 10 specialist nurses, we're going to pay for five, uh, you know, physiotherapists, whatever. There was a tariff uh, for stroke depending on whether you were providing a hyperacute stroke centre, a stroke unit or a TIA clinic. And that tariff is intended to cover uh, the meeting of the standards that we'd set. So the finance directors group uh, worked out a stroke tariff for London and that has since been applied and uh, the money is awarded on the basis of um, a guaranteed uh, delivery which is audited by the uh, clinical stroke uh, director and his team. So the finance work stream on this was very, very important and I think it was a very helpful tool in persuading chief executives that this was something uh, that was, as it were, relatively safe to go into. If you've got your finance director uh, saying that it's okay, then I think, you know, that gives you a degree of confidence. And I was extremely fortunate in NHS London to have a finance director who took a very, very strategic approach to his job um, and had a, you know, good insight and a good understanding of the strategic pr change programme we were trying to, trying to undertake. So this involved clinicians, general managers, finance directors. And the question here, which is, which is another group, is how did you manage the training implications of these changes? Um, so the training side of this was very important. It was one of the tools that we used to um, support people who might otherwise have seen that they were being uh, left behind. You know, those people who thought they could have run a hyperacute stroke centre but were now being told they could only be a stroke unit were fearful that that meant a diminution in their role and in their skill set. So uh, we invested in a significant training program for all staff. So using, for example, we invested in simulation. And Fiona uh, was part of that program. We invested a lot in simulated um, educational tools so that people who weren't used to uh, delivering such acute care thrombolysis, for example, were trained in how to do that. We had a whole e-learning program to make sure that every member of staff could be covered. Uh, there's a whole, uh, there's a, a website uh, link I can give people about the training program 
that we put in place for our existing staff as well as the standards that we set for the recruitment of new staff. And there are standards which people now have to uh, maintain in terms of uh, the quality of the service that we provide. So the training, the workforce modelling side of this, what sort of staffing levels do you need to run these services? And the comparison between that and what we had available and the implications, therefore, for recruitment and for our existing workforce development was a significant programme of work uh, in itself and one that you had some experience of as well. And the dean, so so the dean are very supportive of that programme. So general management, finance, clinicians and, and training and workforce seems to be sort of getting every, everyone together to actually talk um, that talk the same sort of with the, with the same aims. We're not going to get through all these questions. Just a couple. One of us a rather difficult one, given that what the work we've done in in London. There's sort of several with this theme. So in a national system, how do we roll out and best practice nationally? <laughs> London's quite difficult, but just hey, um, try the rest of the country. That's above above my pay grade. Um, I. <laughs> So we find it really difficult in this country, I don't know if it's the same elsewhere, but we find it really difficult to sort of share and learn, you know, share good practice and learn from it. We tend to um, reinvent wheels and London is um, really bad for that. So it worked worse than probably the rest of the country. I think everything's done in London. If it isn't done in London, you know, all of that. So um, we have a problem with that, uh, learning and sharing experience. So I think with stroke care, the... Um, there is now a major national program of data collection and uh, review. So, the, so there's a big national uh, stroke program and the models of care are much debated now about what can and can't work both in urban centres and in rural centres. So I think in stroke we've managed to crack that. So a combination of you know, a national strategy which admittedly in 2006 wasn't getting much attention in terms of implementation and um, the, the work that we've now done, not just in London, but in other cities. So, for example, in Manchester, um, significant work done improving stroke care there means that we're starting to get that, that rollout. But in general, we're pretty bad at it, uh, at rolling out uh, good practice. So I don't have any easy answers to that. People tend to think that their situation is completely different. But again, I think there's a good clinical community now around stroke care uh, that is spreading uh, the expertise across the country. And someone's asked, how do you deal when the stroke unit is full, which sounds almost like a sort of a 20th century question, um, or does this not happen in London? I mean, do you have protected beds is the question. It's sort of a technical, you know, do, do, do you ever do get full up? Do we have protected beds? For yes. So, yes. So the hyperacute stroke centres are required uh, to be able to admit um, the strokes that are brought there. So it is effectively, it, it's, like, it's almost like um, an intensive care unit for, uh, for strokes. So hyperacute stroke centres are centres for stroke care and the expectation is that people will be admitted there. One of the things that, that I think I said in my talk we were worried about was that local hospitals would be full and would refuse to take repatriated patients uh, to the acute stroke unit. And in fact, we haven't found that. So I think partly we've getting the incentives right, financial and otherwise, and partly pride, actually. I think every stroke unit and every hyperacute stroke unit in London now has a degree of pride in making this a standard, as standard a service as we can for the entire population. And so the sorts of problems that we thought we'd have of blocking uh, the hyperacute stroke centres hasn't happened. Now, that's not to say that, you know, some days of the week hospitals aren't under pressure. Of course they are, especially at the moment. Um, but uh, the sorts of problems that we envisaged and that certainly some of the prophets of doom said we didn't, in fact, uh, we didn't, in fact, uh, get not to anything like the same degree. Okay. Ruth, thank you very much. Just before I, I thank Ruth, just, just to say, really, keep those tweets coming, those questions coming to hashtag quality2013, because we'll pick those um, up afterwards. I'd just like to, Ruth, thank you very much indeed. Leadership is the art of the possible. And also, I think something you have said, that leadership in healthcare certainly involves relationships and alliances. You have actually managed to get relationships and alliances between the um, core people involved um, in stroke care, from finance to general manager to, to, to clinicians to training, and brought them all together. And actually, over of a longish term to come to a really fantastic outcome. Thank you very much indeed as a Londoner and as, um, for, for what you've done for London and as part of the Strategic Advisory Board for coming and sharing this with us today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.